This is the story of our Vietnam service members. The story that needs to be told. This is what this 50th anniversary is all about. It's another opportunity to say to our Vietnam veterans what we should have been saying from the beginning. You did your job. You served with honor. You made us proud. You came home and you helped build the America that we love and that we cherish. You know, I spent a fair amount of time in the 82nd and we would have a, a reunion every year. And we'd bring in the veterans would all come in and we'd, we'd talk about it, you know, what their experiences were. A lot of them were World War II vets and those were great. But the Vietnam vets, you could tell, felt like they weren't understood. You know, there's all the heroes of the World War II movies and, and of course, a little bit in Korea. But, but the Vietnam vets couldn't relate to the same stories that the World War II vets could tell about, you know, A Bridge Too Far and D-Day and all those Hollywood kinds of movies that glorified all that. And then, what were the movies that were being shown and the books that were being written about? There, most of them were fairly negative, and so that you know, they, they, I think they were struggling with that. And so it's time to, you know, recognize that is what it is. But you know, let, let's let's also focus more on uh, their selfless service, their their life of, of the Army Creed. I mean, they were the latest greatest generation of their time. Great veterans have a have a tale to tell and that's why this commemoration we're doing now is so important so they can talk back to the American people and tell them what it was really like. My name is George Brewer. I was one of the proud Marines serving in Vietnam from 1968, 69 and 1971 to 72. I am Bruce Gardner. I was honored to serve as an Army helicopter pilot from 1970 to 71. I am Richard Yanis. I proudly served in Vietnam in 1968 and 1969 as a young Army soldier. I'm Roger Houck. I was honored to serve as a sensor planning officer for the U.S. Air Force in Thailand in 1970 and 1971. I am Bill King, and I was honored to be an Army soldier serving in Vietnam from 1969 to 1970. My name is Lars Larson. In 1971 and 72, I was a combat infantryman in Vietnam. I'm Michael Lambert. I served proudly in the Republic of Vietnam from 1969 through 1972. I was a Korean linguist. My name is Benjamin Morgan, and from 1968 to 1969, I served as a sailor in the coastal city of Da Nang, Republic of Vietnam. I'm Robert. Thorn. I served three tours in Vietnam from 66 to 72 with the 3rd Ordnance Battalion, 101st Airborne Division, and 82nd Airborne Division. Well, life uh, for me before going to Vietnam, I was born and raised in South Dakota, and uh, as, as a young boy growing up, our thing was uh, of course, we wanted to play Cowboys and Indians and war. I was uh, uh, kind of uh, structured around the Korean War, and there was a lot of uh, folks within our town that, that went to the Korean War. So you heard the Korean War stories, and, and that kind of uh, drove us kids to play war. So I always wanted to be a hero warrior. Type. Well, I was drafted into the Army. At 18 years old, I was living in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I was a, I just finished Fayetteville Tech Institute custodian course, and I received my draft notice. And my draft notice contained I was 1A, show up as soon as possible. There were nine kids in my family. At, at the time I volunteered for Vietnam, I was a sophomore in college. My father had five children in college at the same time and I uh, enlisted, I volunteered to go from my Naval Reserve Unit on active duty. Uh, I lived in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, 
I was 17 years old uh, when I enlisted. Uh, it was scary because uh, the point of making a decision to come in the military was not my own. It was one of my parents. Uh, I'm kind of glad they did that now, but then I wasn't so excited about it. The minute you hit the country, a clock started on your time there. And everybody was arriving at different times, so within a unit, people were coming and going constantly. And I was picked up uh, when I would count my first day in Vietnam on the 30th of January, 1968, and uh, flown from Wei Phu Bai to Quang Tri, which is almost at the DMZ, one town south of the Danilo Dry Zone. And uh, the first flight I was in, I was in the jump seat, and we got a bullet hole in the windshield, and I'm pounding this warrant officer flying the aircraft on his shoulder, yelling at him what happened. And he said, I don't know, sir. I was a second lieutenant. I don't know, sir. Just been this way the past few days, and it was the first day of Tet. No one had any idea what Tet was. Uh, when we arrived in Vietnam, we arrived in Tan Sinh Air Force Base to a 122 rocket attack. So as we got off our, <coughs> our aircraft arriving, our commercial aircraft, we were hustled right out into a bunker complex for which we, sta we stayed there for about two hours until the rocket attack was finished. They put us on a truck and they hauled us out to Cameron Bay. My first day in Vietnam uh, was very traumatic. I got there on a C-130. I went through Okinawa, left out of Travis Air Force Base. And when I came off the airplane, and we all lined up and we were all in formation, I was a brown bar lieutenant, Marine. I'd been through training. And I looked down to the left and I looked over to the right. And all I saw was rows of coffins with American flags on them. And I looked at the guy next to me and looked around and I said, I guess that's what we're here for. Huh? And it proved to be very true for a lot of us and I feel like I was very fortunate to have survived. It was a sunny day and it was very emotional to see those flags. And little did I realize how many of the buddies that I had gone through infantry school with and everything else may have been among those coffins going back home. Militarily speaking, South Vietnam is divided into four areas. The Fourth Corps area in the south, the Third Corps, the Second Corps, and in the north, the First Corps. I was a sensor planning and placement officer, planning the, the emplacement and execution of missions that emplaced uh, acoustic and seismic devices. Uh, along uh, what we call the strategic supply route, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, running from uh, North Vietnam down through Laos, Cambodia, and back into uh, 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 South Vietnam. We used to call ourselves the uh, Laotian Highway Patrol. The mission of Naval Support Activity Da Nang, where I was assigned, and my mission as a seaman were exactly the same, Naval Logistics. Da Nang was the Navy's largest overseas command. It supported over 200,000 U.S., Vietnamese, and friendly foreign forces in their fight against the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. Uh, we ate sea rations, which were really the same rations that my father had in World War II and folks had in Korea, but we'd mix them with in-flight rations because that had orange juice, and then we'd eat the LERP rations, which were dried food uh, that you could mix with water, and we tried to keep a kind of a variety of those meals. The food was actually very good. Uh, the food was prepared in dining halls run by soldiers, we had soldiers for cooks, unlike the way everything is contracted out right now. Uh, in fact, I enjoyed the food so much, I, I purposefully uh, gained about 30 pounds while I was in Vietnam, which was not most people's experience. They would lose some weight. Uniforms, just very, they were a very lightweight, uh, drab, olive green, uh, multi pocket shirt, trousers, web boots, uh, very standard for that time. 
uh, unlike the uniforms we have today. Uh, they really wore out. I, mean, I can remember getting my uniform done by the villagers. After three or four washes, they would fall apart because you put rice starch in them, you know, you beat them down on rocks and everything. And after a while, between that and the heat, eventually they just fall apart. The only power that we had on the on the landing zone was one 5kW generator, which we weren't allowed to use at night because of flight discipline. The landing zone was either rocketed or mortared every night, not most nights. It was rocketed or mortared every night. Letters, the first letter I got when I was in Vietnam the first time was four months from the time I left the States. But it didn't bother me because I knew I had a job to do. I got written, I got written letters every time the uh, mail came in in a box normally. All the guys were, were depending on me to be around them when the mail came in because I normally had a box from, from my mother, my sister, my brother, or my friends. It was rather humorous and, and was we were taking a resupply and we were in a, basically a triple canopy jungle so they flew over us, kicked our supplies out and one of them was the mail bag which we all looked forward to mail. And it came ricocheting down through the trees and it finally landed and we went over to open it up. Everybody's excited about getting mail and found out it was drenched with this red liquid. And one of my soldiers' mothers thought she would be a real sweetheart and send him a small bottle of red wine. It broke when it hit the trees. Everybody had wine-scented mail, which really wasn't what we wanted at that particular point in time. I think the biggest difference in equipment between Vietnam and now is that in Vietnam, so much of the uh, operations were uh, what we refer to as dismounted infantry, people walking through the jungle. So that, uh, you weren't uh, transported a lot of places and there weren't the IEDs that we have now, the uh, improvised explosive devices. So we did not have the um, heavily armored uh, vehicles that we have now. We did not need those. Since we were light infantry patrolling on the ground in the mountains, uh, most of our equipment was very similar to what my father had in World War II in Korea, a rifle, grenades, rucksack, and uh, rations that you carried. But the big thing was the helicopter, and that's how we got around and got in and out of the jungle. Well, I think technologies we use today that would have helped what we were doing back at that time, certainly the connectivity, the networking, uh, even the social uh, media would have been a huge uh, benefit, I, I think. People laugh about the Pentagon as a huge bureaucracy, but someone in the Pentagon made a decision on the UH-1D model that it didn't have enough power for Vietnam. And they changed the key performance parameter that it had to hover out of ground effect on a 95 degree day at 4,000 feet pressure altitude. And uh, to do that, they had to add 300 horsepower to it. So instead of 1,100 in the D model, the model that I only flew in Vietnam had 1,400 horsepower, limited by the pilot to 1,100, but you always had that 1,100. I wouldn't be here today if I had not had that extra 300 horsepower. The pace I was at, we, we used to have a saying that the snakes uh, have the right of way. And to get from the uh, location where I was billeted to the uh, unit where I was assigned to, it was, about, it was about a half a mile walk. And you were walking through very heavily forested jungle. And uh, again, snakes have the right of way. It was not uncommon to see uh, king cobras, mambas, all kinds of poisonous snakes. And you simply gave way to them. <laughs> but that, that, that's a memory I'll never uh, forget. Our mission was to patrol the hills west and south of Chu Ai uh, to try and prevent the uh, Viet Cong and the Vietnamese from firing rockets into Chu Ai, which was a major base for the 23rd Infantry Division. So there was a lot of walking through the triple canopy jungle, some rice paddy work, but we preferred to stay out in the mountains itself. Every day that you woke up, you felt lucky to be alive. People don't really understand about serving until you were part of it, but I thought you had to be a battlefield soldier or a Purple Heart. No. 
if you're on this number one team called Army, no matter what your capacity, you're a team member. When we happened to fly in someplace and uh, we were required to put guards up because uh, there was instances of uh, uh, the um, insurgents, if you will, like to uh, drop hand grenades down our, uh, into our fuel tanks on our helicopters, so we had to stand guard. But the day I went in, flew into Dong Ha from south, we were in the middle of an artillery attack. We had to take and offload all the troops out of the back while the C-130 still was going down the runway. And we just jumped out, rolled out, and hit to the side, and there was artillery exploding everywhere. But the camaraderie ship was, um, in, in my humble opinion, uh, off the Richter scale. If you went down, uh, there wasn't a person around that wouldn't plow through a lot of bullets to get you out. We go in to pick up the wounded, and it's a uh, fairly small clearing. You maybe could get two, two hitters in it, but we were a single ship. We went in, and as soon as I went in, I turned around and faced out the way I was going. They started to bring the uh, wounded soldiers over to the ship, and a North Vietnamese that is in a tree empties an entire AK-47 clip into the side of the helicopter. And uh, of the clip, nine rounds hit the aircraft. One of the rounds hit the engine on the bleed band, so the engine's not working right. Another round hit the oil tank, so the oil tank actually exploded. And the other rounds went between me and the co-pilot and uh, totally destroyed the dashboard where all the instruments were. And the guy I'm flying with, who's not in command of the aircraft, wants to land. I'm determined we're going to leave. And we had a little disagreement about it for a few seconds, but we did leave. And I did fly at five and a half kilometers to an Army fire base and did a hard landing on it. Not much left of the helicopter after that. But the good luck of being that close to having your head blown off uh, to being able to fly to safety was just amazing. Well, I was staying there nine months. I was forced to go on R&R. &R. So I went on R&R &R to Hong Kong, Kowloon, the new island in Hong Kong, and I enjoyed myself. And my second R&R &R was I came to the States for seven and seven. Yes, I enjoyed myself, but I hated to go back to Vietnam. <laughs> but for one, I was leaving the States, but after I got flying into the country, I knew I was going to see my buddies again, so I fell in love with the idea of going back to Vietnam. Uh, Bob Hope, of course, was all over Southeast Asia. And Bob Hope was uh, somewhere around Saigon. He wasn't in Saigon. I had the good fortune of being able to see Bob Hope. We had to leave at 6.30 in the morning to get there by 8 for the show with Bob Hope and Ann Margaret at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Hey, here we are at Lai K. And i got to be honest with you, I know Lai Kei. Now, it's a real thrill to be here at Lai K, home of the Big Red One. This is quite a spot. I stepped off the plane. I was mugged by a mosquito. <laughs> Favorite song in, uh, in the 60s uh, was uh, I Don't Get Any Satisfaction. I Don't Get sat Any Satisfaction. We played that frequently in the aircraft because we had speakers. We, we mounted speakers and that we played I Don't Get No Satisfaction. I still recall the, uh, the song, I think, that uh, everyone over there had committed to memory, uh, leaving on a jet plane to make that trip back home. I think during the 60s, um, there were so many good songs and good groups. I think I really like um, the Hollies and the version they did called He's Not Heavy, He's My Brother. The one song that I think every soldier, airman, and Navy guy who served in Vietnam had as their song was that one by the animals I believe it was we got to get out of this place the, the uh, favorite song was uh, catch a quick plane to get out of here <laughs> one of the most moving uh, films and themes that, that 
got me through Vietnam was the theme from Wanda Kani and the, the song More. And it was more than the greatest love the world has known. This is the love I give to you alone. James Brown, say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. The memories were obviously difficult in the sense of what was going on in the news and the radio and the protests that were happening in the streets against the war. And, that the, and then what really distressed me as a, as a young child and an elementary student because my dad was a soldier and people were protesting about soldiers and it just, in my opinion, was wrong. You can protest the war and disagree with the war, but the soldiers are doing what the nation asked them to do. Well, during the time I came back from 67, but we was, we was already told that what was going to happen to us when we arrived in the States, there were violence and you know, people against us going to do what we were sent to do for the country. And uh, each t time there was something to come back to what was happening, what shouldn't have been happening. 67 was Detroit riots. I was in the 82nd, assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division. I went to, up to Detroit and I came back home January 67. And when I went over for Tet of 68, I came back to DC riots, which were the riots they started after they killed Martin Luther King. And 72 when I came home. The country was trying to come out of Vietnam, so it wasn't a pleasant thing. We, there was no, a lot of money, and there was ho homeless vets, and there was families without their, their dads, brothers, and sisters. But the times that were good were the times when we survived getting shot at. The times that were good were when we uh, had to say goodbye to friends whose tours were over. My finest memory, uh, as well as everybody else's was probably the day that you boarded the airplane going home. Huh? That was special. Yes, I still think about Vietnam every day. And you, you can't forget it if you lived, lived that life and you think about your friends you lost in Vietnam. In a professional sense, uh, I've, I've always looked back at that experience as uh, it, it, it will never get any tougher than this. If, if, you, can, if you can handle uh, what you handled in Southeast Asia, you can handle anything, in my case, that the Air Force threw at me. I have no regrets for having served in Vietnam. Vietnam gave me my life's work. I made many friends. I learned the skills that I needed to become a professional logistician. And it gave me an opportunity to share my experiences with other people. I think my life has been affected by Vietnam in, in, in some important ways. It certainly um, uh, contributed to my uh, military career in terms of background and experience. And um, it, it certainly uh, was part of what forged a, a, a tight link between me and, and the United States Army. So in that sense, it uh, was a catalyst to, uh, you know, to progress and to stay in the military longer. Do I think about my Vietnam experience? Um, I guess the, the truthful answer would be yes, I sure do. Uh, the things that I learned <clears throat> in Vietnam uh, that, uh, that have never gone away is uh, don't take anything for granted. That, uh, and the other thing that, that, that I will never forget is the, the ingenuity of the individual soldier is unbelievable. Uh, they will do, regardless of rank, regardless of service, regardless of anything, they will do just beyond belief, human, unhuman type of things without any direction. They just do it. I've never been back to Vietnam. I have mixed emotions about going back. I think I would enjoy the people. I would enjoy the sights. But there are a lot of memories there that uh, would question whether I really wanted to go back into the area, particularly where I worked. I, I have... Uh spent a lot of time looking at Google overhead uh, imagery of uh, the base I was located at. It's almost totally overgrown. 
Uh, but uh, I would like to return at some point in the future to visit uh, a few of the bases to include going to uh, some of the locations in Vietnam that I visited. I would love to go back. Uh, several of my friends have gone back. The experience is great and wonderful. Uh, the country is booming. Oh my God. I have a high regard for the Vietnamese people that have the courage and, and uh, that, have, that have come to America. And uh, they wouldn't have that opportunity if we hadn't done what we did. The war is over as it should be and it should be over in the minds. My generation it should only be a memory good, bad or otherwise but the young people coming forward it should be a homeland that they love and respect and cherish. I've been to the wall twice and each time it's difficult really difficult. And here just recently, uh, within the last year and a half, I went to my basic school, 367 reunion, and we rang the bell for all those men that never came home. And it was, I think about it a lot, and with reverence. Well, I certainly consider the uh, Vietnam vets to to be uh, deserving of as much honor and praise as, as any conflict uh, before us. The, uh, I think the willingness to serve and the willingness to um, endure dangers and hardships uh, are universal with all conflicts. And uh, whether or not one agrees or disagrees with uh, a political background or foundation for a conflict uh, doesn't really affect the, uh, the individual soldier. My personal lessons learned uh, was probably one of them that you are always amazed at what you can do if you put yourself in a position where you force yourself to do something. Uh, there were some very difficult times and I was amazed at the human spirit of others that could go ahead and, and accomplish things that you didn't think they could. We aren't heroes just because we go. We're heroes more because we help each other, because we do fight for what we believe in, and because of the fact that our, that our republic has largely remained unchanged to this time. These quiet heroes who we slogged through jungles with, fought side by side with, were wounded with, and sometimes helplessly watched die, always considered themselves just ordinary people. But they were far from ordinary. They viewed themselves as just well, ordinary because they were humble, patriotic, and selfless. Thanks for your service. Thanks for what you've done. Uh, we appreciate you. Your sacrifices uh, were not in vain. You, you did what the nation asked you to do. As we salute our own, I would like to send a special thanks for our Vietnam vet for all they have done and continue to do for our nation and the G4. My generation thanks you. Thank you for your service. I am proud to help salute our own. As a veteran, I understand your service. Your service paved the way for me to serve. Thank you for your sacrifice. I know you still carry the scars from Vietnam and I am forever grateful for your service. As a fellow veteran and service member, thank you very much for your service and sacrifice. If you haven't heard it, welcome home. As a wife to a Vietnam veteran, thank you for your support and sacrifice. I had family members and friends that served in the Vietnam War. I would like to give a heartfelt thank you to both family and the veterans of the Vietnam War. Your sacrifices were not in vain. Welcome home. How I would describe a, a Vietnam veteran a warrior patriot. Um, they fought in a, you know, a faraway place, in difficult times, with uh, lots of political decisions that were made that probably was very frustrating to them, and yet they did it. And uh, welcome home. Welcome home, finally.